Welcome once again to Wednesday noon day Bible class at Community Baptist Church in Santa Rosa, California. The pastor is Reverend Dr. H. B. Turner. My name is Brother Jim Kennedy, and my sister uh, Maria Dreyer is the one who taught these lessons so you can follow along with us. The lesson today is session two. Does it bring conviction? And uh, that your Bibles will be coming from Acts two. 32 to 41. You want to pray for our prayer request, uh, our sick and shut-in, and our, the ones on our prayer list. Uh, we pray for our sick and shut-in, Roy and Barbara Johnson, Hank and Ann Des Jarden, Anita Marie Johnson, Scott Ardridge, Harvey Johnson, Nick Carter, Deacon Barnum Duncan, Joseph Hampton, Ken and Virginia Sanders, Rhoda uh, Wilsey, Annette Jones, Larry Henry Sr., Raymond Lawrence, Georgia Baton, Eloise Harris, uh, Eloise Oliver, Arnie Harris, Sharon Rockstead, Michael Peterson Jr., Beverly Pons, Dolores Collins, uh, Leslie Beaton, and Lindsay Ramson. We pray for Sister Maria Hopkins for blessing and encouragement, brother. Christian Rogers for healing of gunshot wound to his leg. Uh, Deacon Barnum O'Duncan for healing and comfort. Brother Dietrich Gage for salvation and guidance. Brother PJ Bastini for strength and encouragement. For Deacon for Dietrich and Edward family for strength. Sister Anita Jones for comfort and healing for Morris. Uh, the Kimball family at the loss of Wally Kimball, Chris and Mona McFadden and family for uplifting and protection of Johnson family at the loss of Sister Leslie Johnson, CBC staff, Sister Maria Dreyer and Brother Jim Kennedy, ministries, Reverend Francis, Reverend Parker and Reverend Stings, Auxiliaries, ministries, teacher, and church family, our pastor, Reverend Dr. H. Turner, for wisdom, direction, and protection. We start off with a scripture and then have prayer. We read the Psalms 100. Says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord of all ye land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and that not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. And bless him be to the hearing and reading of Psalms 100. Follow word prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Thank you for this day, Lord. We pray that you would just uh, guide us and direct us through this lesson, Lord, that the Holy Spirit minister our hearts and minds and souls, Lord. Lord, touch those prayer requests that were lifted up to you and the ones out there watching and their prayer requests, Lord, we lift them up to you and say, you will be done in their lives, Lord. We pray, uh, Lord, that uh, the Holy Spirit will minister to us uh, through this lesson today, Lord. We thank you and we praise you and we pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, in session two, does it bring conviction? The point is the voice of God seeks to convict us of the truth. The passage is Acts 2, 32 to 41. The Bible meets life. I once spent four hours with a man urging him not to commit adultery with a married woman. He tried to assure me that he and his uh, and the other woman had prayed about their relationship. They believed God has granted them a love for one another and was releasing them from their marriage vow. The reason that God would not give them this love unless it intended for them to be together. The Holy Spirit assures me this was false and that they were in clear violation to God's command in Scripture. The Holy Spirit was obvious convicting the man for he went to great lengths to justify his sinful behavior. Only later, after the two families of the church uh, had suffered much cartridge, uh, did this man acknowledge God's conviction. God has warned him of what he was doing, but he has refused to listen. 
The primary way God speaks is by convicting us of our sin. He loves us too much to allow us to rush head on into sin without calling us to repent and turn unto him. Return to him. Acts 2, 32-36. This Jesus said was God raised up uh, whereof we all are witness. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heaven, but he said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. Until I make thy foes and thy footstools. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom you have crucified with Lord and Lord and Christ. He words all the house of Israel, verse 36. This phrase refers to the descendants of Jacob, Israel. It could mean specifically that old northern kingdom, but it probably refers to all Jews. Christ, uh, verse 36, this title derives from the Greek is based on the Hebrew word for anointed, frequently translated a Messiah. Some people get needlessly bogged down with seeking to hear God's voice and discovering his will for every little mundane decision. God generally speaks to us about his concern and priorities. He speaks so that we will know what is on his heart. Inviting us to join him in his work. God's primary concern for people is that they be in the right relationship with him. Amen. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, then God's primary focus is not on what company you work for or what neighborhood you live in. His focus is on seeing you acknowledge that you are a sinner and turn from your sin and place your faith in Christ. If you have not yet made this most important decision, turn to the inside front cover of this book. Acts 2 begins with the Holy Spirit coming upon the 120 followers of Jesus in the upper room. This led to Peter's sermon one be preached to the multitude of Jewish people who filled the streets. In, of Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. During such feasts, the population of Jerusalem could swell from 55,000 to 108,000 people. God often speaks through the preaching of this word. In this case, Peter preached about the resurrection and the exaltation of Jesus. The gospel hinges on Jesus being raised from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Peter proclaimed that he and his following disciples were witness to the resurrection. This authenticated Peter's message, for he did not speak of what he did not know, but rather he preached out of his personal experience. Peter declared that after Jesus' resurrection, God sent the Holy Spirit. The evidence of the spiritual working was evidence to everyone present. For everyone heard that the disciples speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God in Acts 2.11. A clear sign that if someone speaks a word that was given to them from God, the Holy Spirit confirms the message. Peter cited in Psalms 110.1. In which they prophesied the, of the Messiah. It was a favorite passage in the very church, Mark 12, um, 12, 35, 37. Let's look at that. Mark 12, 12 35. The 37, later as Jesus, this is a, a living translation, later as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple, he asked, why do the teachers of religion well claim that the Messiah is the son of David? For David himself, speaking only the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, the Lord said to my Lord, 
sit in the place of honor and at my right hand and fill on humble your enemies beneath your feet. And uh, since David himself told the Messiah, my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? The Lord shall listen to him with great delight. In First Corinthians 12, uh, First Corinthians 15, 25, For Christ must, uh, must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And Hebrews 1 13. And God never said to any of the angels, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand, for I humble your enemy. Make them a footstool on your feet. And ten Hebrew ten thirteen and Hebrew ten thirteen and he waited until his enemies were humbled and he made pistols under uh, under his feet. It indicates that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord, the Savior of all who place their trust in him. Referring to Psalms 110 also offers encouragement because the through the church might suffer at the hands of its enemy for a time. God the Father will defeat every foe and place them in submission to Christ. Mm -hmm. Peter reached the climax of his sermon in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter spoke these words with certainty. He emphasized that it was they who crucified Jesus. They may not have hammered the nails into Jesus' hands and feet, but they were complicit by their sins and rebellion against God and the rejection of the Messiah. The telling sign that the word comes from God is the centrality of Jesus Christ, especially his death and resurrection. Throughout church history, there have been, been false prophets who proclaim message about the purification rites, feasts, and festivals, or uh, methodology. False messengers tend to focus on secondary, non-essential matters. When God speaks, he uplifts Christ and his work. The Holy Spirit also brings conviction, conviction of sin. Peter declares it was his listeners who were enemies of God. When God speaks to you, he will draw attention to the sin of your life and your, your disobedience to his word. God will point out anything in your life that is disrupting your fellowship with him. God knows you what matters most in your life, and he will speak to those issues in the Holy Spirit's role to reveal and fight God's truth to you and I. And that's uh, John 16, 13, and 34. How can we continue to be witnesses of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection today? Uh, how can we witness to a witness of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection? By obeying his commands and following his, uh, his word, you know, we can be a witness and knowing that Jesus lives and um, he lives in us. So by obeying it, we uh, be it to him. Uh, uh, he shares his, his spirit with us. Acts 2, 37, 38. Now when they hear this, they will prick in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The distinguishing characteristic of God's voice is that his word always calls for a response. You cannot remain indifferent uh, to it. You can reject it or obey it, but you cannot remain neutral. 
When Peter preaches to the crowd, the Holy Spirit affirms his word to those who were listening. As a result, they were pricked in their hearts. Amen. So that's kind of the answer right there. This indicates a deep emotion, pain, as the Jewish people realize to their own honor that are waiting for the country for their Messiah, they have crucified him. Jesus promised that when the Holy Spirit came, he would convict the world of sin and the righteous of the judgment, John 16, 8. We, uh, we each have a sinful nature and are inherently evil and rebellious against God. We do not naturally do what is right or good, Romans 3, 10 uh, to 12. Our conscience are so seared by sin that we would be without hope if it were not for uh, God's gracious work to convict us of our sin. In this passage in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit took Peter's word, words and applied them compellingly to the people's heart. When God speaks, the Holy Spirit will bring the word, uh, words to your spirit that you will know the messages from him. The people responds to Peter's sermon by explaining, men and brethren, what shall we do? The people spontaneously understood that they must act immediately based on God's word to them. This is often a major difference between Satan's words and God's word. Satan will try to make you feel guilty and then not offer any solution for you to find freedom. God, on the other hand, will convict you of sin, but uh, will then offer a remedy. Word from Satan leads to guilt and shame. Word from God leads to repentance and life. Peter instructs uh, the crowd to repent. That is to confess their wrongdoing, turn their lives to, in a different direction. What does it mean uh, to repent of our sins? This is uh, to repent of our sins. And he is, uh, to, Know that you're guilty of sin and repent and turn to God and uh, His way. Confess the wrongdoing and turn your lives in a different direction mm -hmm. to God. Right? So Peter then Peter told them to be baptized. Baptized is an outward sign of the inner transformation. It is significant that a person's sinful nature will die and they will have been born again to become a child of God. Baptism doesn't save anyone. It is the public testimony that someone has repented of his sin and identified himself with Christ as his Lord and Savior. Amen. The New Testament assumes that if all who were born again will be baptized. Baptism symbolically identifies a person with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It symbolized death to sin and being raised in a new life in Christ. Mm -hmm. Digging deeper. Baptism and Mary Church. It says those who repent receive two things. First, they receive forgiveness from their sin. This would have been wonderful news for those who listened to Peter, having been mortified in the cruel way they had treated the Messiah. The Jews might have assumed. There was no way to uh, peace or an offer holy God, but there, but to their relief, Peter assured them that forgiveness and restoration were possible through Christ. Yeah. Second, those who repent of their sin receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Christians often talk about gifts of the Spirit. First Corinthians eleven four through eleven. Let's look at that. Yeah. That's the gifts of the first Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12. 12, 12, 4 through 4 through 11. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but in the same God, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. The spiritual gifts is given to each of us so we can help each other. 
To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another and to someone else. The, uh, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He who gives one person the power to perform miracles, and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether the message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak an unknown language, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. And uh, it is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. But neglect the fact that the Holy Spirit himself is the ultimate gift. Amen? When the Holy Spirit enters your life, you have every resource of God at your disposal to enable you to do God's will. Amen? Why is repentance an important response to the hearing of God's word? Because God wants you to repent, turn to Him. He wants you, because of the convict of sin, when you turn from sin and turn to God, then He'll heal you. Acts 2 39 41. For the uh, commission is unto you, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God should call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this un this untoward, untoward generation. Then they then they that uh, are gladly receive his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about three thousand souls. As Peter concluded his sermon, he offered hope and encouragement to the listeners. This is a distinguished mark of a word from God. Satan will seek to discourage you and lead you to a place of hopelessness. God desires to save you from your sin and give you eternal life. God's word bring hope for better days ahead. Peter refers to God's promise. Later in his ministry, Peter again spoke encouraging words about God's promise in 2 Peter 1 4. He knew that whatever God promised, he would most certainly fulfill. Peter emphasized the scope of God's promise of salvation. It is for all who believe and trust when God called. Peter has early referred God's promise to the prophet Joel, that God would pour out by spirit upon all flesh, Acts 2 17. God also foretold that those who were far away from him would be saved, Isaiah 57, 19. The Jewish people often were guilty of assuming that God's salvation was exclusive for them. But God promised that it would be available to all people, even those who were far from God. People often hoped that the people would could repent of their sin, that they their children could experience salvation. This was good news indeed. We must always be aware that the decision we make with God has profound consequences upon our children and grandchildren. I grew up in a home of godly parents who modeled faith in God for me. Both my parents grew up in homes of godly parents. Their grandparents also modeled faith in God. I have no doubt that much of what I enjoy in my walk with God today is a result of the decisions my ancestors made many years before. Peter urged that people to save yourself from this out, out, out for generation. Being saved is a fundamental need for every person. But everyone who has ever been saved from God from a dangerous situation or from a medical emergency. Know the enormous relief that comes when you have been preserved from harm of death. Peter understood that eternal proof that each of his listeners, listeners faced. So I preached with urgency. 
the pros of living in sin is uh, being a part of corrupt generation headed for destruction. The result of Peter's sermon was that 3,000 people accepted the message and were baptized. Amen. Jesus had foretold this, his disciples would do greater things than he had done in John 14 12. In one sermon, Peter saw more people find salvation and enter the kingdom of God that occurred during Jesus' earthly ministry. This reflects the impact found in a, in a word from God and that is delivered in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our focus in this study is to discern the voice of God. Last week's session reminded us of, to ensure that what we're hearing is in line with God's word. But let's consider also what the voice is calling us to. Is there a conviction of sin, or is it leading me to a place of hopeless? Am I being pointed to Christ and his mercy and grace? When God speaks, he always speaks words of truth and grace designed to bring us close to him. The world to do we pray in the Holy Spirit bring conviction to people. Amen. Being a good witness. Being a witness of walking with the Lord, you know. Uh, engage. There are any distractions in your life preventing you from hearing the conviction of the Holy Spirit will explain. We need to do that during that meditating that. Live, live it out. How will you live out the truth in this passage? Receive Christ. If you have never repented of your sin and place your faith in Christ, do so now. Make an appointment with a pastor or a Christian friend and settle this crucial matter for inside the front cover of this book will help. Confess sin. The conviction works of the Holy Spirit is not limited to your needs for salvation. After salvation, we still sin. What has the Holy Spirit been convicting you of? Consider what sins the Holy Spirit is pinpointing in your life that He wants you to cleanse and forget. Respond to everything God points out to you. Don't be satisfied until you have been set free from every sin. Share Christ. Even as the Holy Spirit works through Peter, He wants to work. Through you, pray for the opportunity to be used by him to speak his truth into the lives of others. When the opportunity arises, trust God to work through you and reveal his salvation. Okay, uh, baptized and we we'll baptized in the early church. On the day of Pentecost, at the conclusion of the sermon, Peter exhorted his audience to repent and to baptize every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 238. In the aftermath of this invitation, about 3,000 new believers were baptized that day. When the apostles baptized or uh, convert converts, However, they uh, refused the Jewish ritual, which entirely moved me instead of only purification, which must be repeated. Christ's baptism was one time ceremony performed in the name of Jesus Christ. It represents forgiveness of sin and reception of the Holy Spirit. Not only did the baptized invoke the name of Jesus, but the new believer also called upon his name. 22, 16, and thus proclaim the gospel. Implying these early baptisms with the idea that the believer is united with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Then, alike as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. 64. Every baptism recorded in Acts was conducted in the name of Jesus. Within a few decades, the, the period formula began to be invoked following the pattern of Matthew 28, 18, 20. Now that's, uh, yeah. that's, that's uh, I think, okay, let's look at that one. Matthew 28, Eighteen to twenty. 
And I said, that Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to serve all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. 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 Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Diatich, a church manual composed of the ends of the first century, instructed the ministrators to baptize three times in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The natural also listed three possible modes of baptism. The use of living or running water was preferred. The next best option was water, preferably cold. Collected in the cistern and poured was allowed in the region where the water could be sacred. I don't know what the word is. Clearly, immersion was the favorite mode of baptism in every possible. And that's what we believe in the most immersion. In his early history, the church began teaching catechism to new believers. Uh, Deity preface baptismal instruction with the two ways. Track this track instruction baptism candidates to live the way of life or to reject the way of death. Echoing Jesus' warning in Matthew 7, 13, 14. Let's look at Matthew 7, 13, 14. Seven. 13 and 14 says, Enter ye into the straight gates, for the wide is the gate that God is the way that leads to destruction, and many, many there be which go in there of that. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Fasting also was an important preparation for baptism, according to the the candidates, the ministries, and the able members of the congregation fasted for a day or two. At the turn of the first century, we find the New Testament baptism remained absolutely unchanged. In this early church manual, baptism retained its simplicity. Fast forward a century or so, and baptism transformed into an elaborate ritual full of symbolism. The apostolic tradition, the early third century church manual, attributed to Hippolytus, Hippolytus of Rome, includes a, a lengthy description of the baptism process. Catechism now lasts up to three years, during which candidates learn God's word. And become active and well doing. The apostolic tradition going on. According to the Victorian of Cartridge, Eastern or Pentecost added strongly to the occasion, but on Sunday was accepted. That uh, the Sunday of the candidate prepared for baptism by removing it clothes. Yes, that's right. Name of baptism. Nudity was not scandalous in the culture of public act of God. Usually, that baptisms were separated from church and not in front of the sanctuary. Similarly, similarly New Christian emerged from the water of a new birth in the same native condition of the first birth. Furthermore, the newly baptized received a white wooden robe, picture of Paul, permission to put off the old self and put on the new. Colossians 3 9 10. In the early church, baptism was living illustration of, it, of the believer being raised in newness of life. The church continued to practice triple immersion by adding the baptismal 
prayed in the form of three questions. And then she asked, Do you believe in God, the Father of the Mother? Do you believe in Christ Jesus, the Son of God? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? After each question, the candidate responds, I believe, and is immersed. That's a postulatic tradition. 12, 21, 12 through 18. Let's look at that. Let me see. This is Acts. Okay. The question is struck the new believers to correct the orthodox, the read it out possible heading. In the conclusion of the baptismal service, the entire community prayed together and closed the prayer service with a kiss of peace, sign and final love, and a welcome to God's family. The new member of uh, uh, Christians. Even we have the first Lord's Supper. Okay. Evangelize, many of you be surprised to read that the infants baptizing began by early in the 13th century, around 200. The Italian first mentioned it was practice, but he discouraged it. Um, and preferred to propose it until the age of accountability. Which he identifies as 14 years old. And that baptism they came on the soul 31 age. Others, the third century early church fathers, such as Corinth and Alexander, um, the cycle of Garfield's accept of the practice. And this was a hit all of this instruction and the first baptism of the Williams. If they can speak for themselves, they should do so. If not, their parents or other relatives should speak for them. Even as infant baptism made and enrolled into the church to many Christian parents to lay baptism for their offspring, including days of the great and his brother, Gregory, nice, and Gregory, and anyway, each woman in the fourth century, I finally put the most in codified the practice of theology on infants' baptism by teaching that children were born guilty of Adam's sin and required baptism to clean. In the sixth century, the church, the state, the United Emperor uh, Justin declared infant baptism mandatory. During the church's first six century, immersion was Expected born in baptism, which the exception of the provision of the vanishing and the description of baptism clearly indicates the ministry and place in hand on the candidate's head of the person for her and the symbol of a new believed union with Christ in this death, burial, and passion. Traveling, 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 I have seen a number of ancient. Anyways, by proving the practice of immersion and such widespread religion as in the desert of Beth Shah, Israel, and the Association of the Saints, and that Rome, and from its inception, the church had a certain Jesus command to baptize a baptism ritual in the meaning charge to Christianity. First six century, for instance, centuries or so. Baptism maintained the simplicity of the New Testament practice. Eventually, the ritual took on layers of symbolism, symbolism, and mechanics to illustrate new believers initiated into the Christian community. An unregrettable, unbiblical practice of infant baptism was frequent in the place to clear the implication of. Believing baptism by immersion. Well, that was on baptism. But then, and then uh, we'll read, I'll read in front of this, this is what it says about that. 
what are you afraid of? Is it okay to admit it? You have the things you're afraid of. Well, we all do. Some fear many minor, and some fear God. A serious setback to how we live. While we may strive to overcome these fears, there is one fear we should never let go of: the fear of God. The sovereign, all-powerful Creator of all things is holy and righteous, and fully deserves our respect and fear. Because He is holy, He is fully against sin, and our sin deserves His wrath and punishment. But the God who hates sin also loves us. But God commanded His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 5 8. Jesus took the wrath we deserve, who died for us, and offered freedom and forgiveness for our sins. He died the death we deserve, and in doing so, He forgives us. God raised Jesus from the dead, and His resurrection ensures that death was defeated. We can be forgiven of our sins and have eternal life. We no longer have to fear punishment of death. To receive the gift, you must let your, let your sin. To receive the gift, you must let go of your sins. Repent and put your faith in Christ. Admit to God that you are a sinner and ask him to forgive you. Confess your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Express your repentance and faith of my praying a prayer like this. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died on the cross and forgive me for my, of my sins. I'm sorry for all the wrong I've done and ask you to forgive me. I now accept your gift of eternal life. Thank you for your love, forgiveness, and new life in Jesus Christ. From this day forward, I choose to follow you in Jesus' name, amen. So that's a uh, uh, prayer you can prayer, a prayer and staff and God in life, repent from your sin, and ask Christ to come into your, into your life. We are all sinners, but God forgave us. And it's what Christ did for us. He died for our sins. So we, if we accept Him as Lord and Savior our life, turn from our uh, working ways, repent, He will forgive us. And, uh, so you share decisions with Jesus with your pastor or those Bible study group. Get involved in church that will help you grow in your faith. Be baptized as an expression of your faith. So that's how you can be saved. Christ did it for you. So you got to repent and turn and accept the fact that Christ died for your sins. And then goes on the third day. Okay, so the next lesson will be studying. Uh, Will be in session three. And does it call? Uh, does it call you to trust God? And if you want to read ahead, it's Hebrews eleven one through six and thirteen to sixteen. So let's follow the word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today, thanking you for this lesson, Lord. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for all you have done for us, Lord. And we thank you, Jesus, for coming down here and dying for our sins. And, uh, and uh, being crucified, and uh, on the third day he rose, and we at the right hand so, uh, of God the Father, and now he is even for us, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, Lord, which guides and directs you through uh, uh, as we study your word, Lord. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We pray that, Lord, we just uh, glorify you today in our actions and deeds, Lord. We pray for those out there, Lord, and all the prayer and requests that we lift it up to you and we ask that you will be done with each and everyone's life, Lord, that you would uh, speak to their hearts, Lord, and uh, teach them your ways, Lord. Teach us your ways, Lord, and that we may glorify you in our actions lead by being obedient to your Holy Word. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for being our God, Lord. We give you the praise, honor, and glory always. And the praise of Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining. We'll see you next week. Have a blessed week.